Hello, my name is Kevin Inikowski, and this episode is on groups and crowds. Have you ever felt a sense of groupness in groups that you were placed into even when it was just random assortment? Well, that's because very little is actually necessary to make a group. For instance, Taj Fell attempted to study the most minimal conditions necessary to make these intergroup biases. He found that arbitrarily grouping people based on how they estimated the number of dots on a screen was enough for these groups to feel intergroup biases. And the minimum group theory was born, which states arbitrary groups in unimportant categories is sufficient for in-group and out-group biases. People kill each other every day, largely based on random assortment. And you're thinking right now, what do you mean? Well, do you choose who or where or what religion you're born into? I didn't think so. But do most people change their religious identity they're born into? I didn't think so either. Thus, these groupings are largely a random assortment of birth with large associated biases. All right, so what are these groups affecting you? Well, first, there are primary groups, including your friends. (laughs) Ha, that's a joke. And close family. Secondary groups are more temporary, but usually with a goal in mind like your school group to get your diploma or the AA meeting you attend every Wednesday to curb your college addictions. And lastly, reference groups, a term coined by Robert Merton, who argued that when we see groups we aspire to be in, we compare ourselves to them. It's like how many of you might be comparing yourself to the biggest loser if you're trying to aspire to lose all that weight. Now, groups usually have some goals in mind, And these goals can trump any differences held between the groups, like saying the enemy of my enemy is my friend. This is a subordinate goal, which allows parties to forget their differences. And this could be a very useful tool. Maybe some religious groups who insist on hurting each other for differences and praying to essentially the same deity, maybe the subordinate goal of peace or prayer of some sort could be useful. A strategy to meet this subordinate goal is the GRIT strategy, an acronym for Graduated and Reciprocated Initiatives and Tension Reduction. Um, what? Exactly. That's why it's named GRIT. It just involves two steps. First is one party states that they want to cooperate and make a concession. But the key is that this has to be reciprocated by the other party. For instance, religious person A goes, I like God. I want more people to worship God in my way. I will worship God in one of your ways if you worship God in one of mine. Religious person B then needs to reciprocate the concession, which is the second step. For instance, they could say, yes, let's worship in different ways, together. No more death, conflict, illogical tension, everybody wins. But what if person A didn't actually want what they said? What if person A really wanted to make a large group only so more people would donate to her institution for some quick holiday cash? Well, boom, you got a social trap. Social traps are when short-term gains in some of the group hinders the long-term gains in the group as a whole. And what do you know? Everyone hates each other again. But hey, let's be optimistic. Let's say person A goes back to her group and needs to persuade them that this is a good idea to combine religions, to practice together. Well, persuasive arguments theory would say, hey, it won't be that easy. If you want this new group to form, you need to make an argument that is so extreme that they won't refuse. So person A goes, if we don't do this now, I've had a vision. And that vision was of an apocalypse. Something about a flood too and a fortnight or something. And God will only be satisfied if we can bind the two groups and give it, him, or her praise. Assuming that persuasion arguments theory works, they all respond, no, we can't swim. All right, let's do it. And now we have an agreement for the extreme decision to group together instead of the unextreme decision to do nothing. Some other items may be at play. Say that some individuals were rather conservative and didn't think this coming together was such a good idea. But when in the group, their choice on the matter shifted towards coming together. This is called a choice shift. And when the choice shift is towards a riskier decision, it can be specifically called a, what do you know, risky shift. Additionally, say all the people in person A's religion was slightly for the idea at first, and after talking about it for hours, they can see no other logical reason not to group together. Well, this positive influence from others' opinions in the group is called group polarization. Exactly. And you thought having a group senate was a good idea. 
didn't think about group polarization now, did you? So what other influences are at play? Well, why should the group members have even listened to this apocalyptic story? Well, they may have been influenced by the fact that it was coming from a fellow group member, basically a social proof which usually involves multiple members repeating something, but in this case, it's just one person talking about a vision. The influence of this information by the group is called informational influence. Let's say you didn't buy that malarkey because you're a hard-nosed skeptic. Suddenly, you notice everyone muttering amongst themselves, yeah, she must have had a vision because the apocalypse is of course going to happen in our lifetime. Soon you start to say the same absurdities, hoping to gain some acceptance of the others. This is a normative influence, similar to peer pressure. Imagine for a second you were there. You wouldn't believe this absurdity, would you? So you say to your friend, who also happens to be there, this is ridiculous, cockamie, I tell you. Then all of a sudden people start staring at you, and so you quickly blurt out, well, okay, I just found it hard to believe at first, but I'm starting to see that she's telling the truth now. You just exchange your external conflict for an internal conflict. Ooh, but you don't like that, do you? No way. So in order to fix this internal conflict, you must change your belief about the situation. Make a shift. Make your identity shift. Thus, you're an example of the identity shift effect because you change your external conflict for internal ones to subvert the social rejection. Then fix your internal conflict by believing in this malarkey. Notice... This shift started with a need to fit and appear like a conformist, like when you tried drugs in 8th grade. But hey, maybe you're actually resistant to changing your identity, so you quietly reject the norms thinking that all the others are accepting them. Well, this can lead to pluralistic ignorance. For instance, when a teacher asks, are there any confusions? And everyone stays silent even though nobody knows what the heck is going on, but we all think that everyone else understood? That's pluralistic ignorance. If harmony becomes more important than actually evaluating the choice critically, your group has entered the phenomenon known as groupthink, coined by Irving Janus, where harmony becomes more important than critical thinking, like many religions. Groupthink has eight symptoms, which we won't discuss here because they're pretty straightforward. However, I just want to mention one, mind guards. Mind guards are when one or more members acts as a shield from information which contradicts the group. So mind guards are unlikely to promote rational information, only harmonious info. Are you seeing the connection here? Group psychology has a lot to do with the harmony of the group. This is rather important for groups that are increasingly absurd, like many cults. Cults are groups using unorthodox rituals or practices. Sometimes these groups insist in using hallucinogens to practice their faith. But somehow in the United States, this is still lawful because of freedom of religious choice, of course. On the other hand, there are groups which separate from the large religious entities. These are called sects. Not the thing that men think about every waking moment, but groups who only change a few practices of their predominant religion, like the Sunni or Shia sects of Islam. Sex sometimes compete with other sex, leading to hatred for these other groups, a type of outgroup derogation, while at the same time thinking very highly of the group in their own sex, and in-group favoritism, a large issue in politics today. As this outgroup derogation, in-group favoritism can result in a group-serving bias which involves attribution of the group's success to themselves. Our religion has helped millions upon millions of people eat that were starving, But all that death back in the day, oh, that's just because the other religions were just so dang awful, not because of us. Group serving bias. How do we act in the midst of a tons of people? Well, it turns out we don't act very altruistically. The first term that probably comes to mind is the bystander effect. Ever been in this situation? Hey, that guy is having a heart attack. Shouldn't somebody help him? Certainly should. Looks like he's in a ton of pain. Yup. And nobody helps him. The bystander effect states that others in our milieu, that is our social environment, discourages actions towards helping others. Kitty Genovese is the story most often used. However, the logistics of the story was that people actually did call. Others thought they were a couple having a fight and a bunch of other reasons. Thus, it isn't the best example of the bystander effect as we once thought. 
However, many experiments have demonstrated the bystander effect. So why does it occur? Well, one argument is for diffusion of responsibility within the milieu of other people. The diffusion of responsibility is similar to social loafing in a group, which is exactly why working in group projects suck. Sometimes people provide less effort in a group than when working alone, thus social loafing. The diffusion of responsibility may also cause social inhibition. For instance, you have refrained from doing something helpful in public in fear of disapproval, embarrassment, or not sure if you knew you could help in the right way, or maybe somebody else could help better, but you didn't know. This is a social inhibition. It's funny because crowds don't actually pay as much attention to us as we think they do. However, the spotlight effect argues that we think people notice us way more than they actually do. An experiment done had students wear a very bright yellow Barry Manilow t-shirt and found students estimated twice as many people noticed them than actually did. Other experiments found it to be five times as much. So what's the term when this center of attention can either help or hinder your performance on something? Exactly, social facilitation, also called the audience effect and was exemplified in an experiment at the cusp of the 19th century, which found that cyclists would go three times faster when riding with others as compared to riding alone. This was also outlined in the Yerkes-Dodson Law, made in 1908, which said, hmm, there is a relationship between arousal and performance for simple versus difficult tasks that can be graphed. That is to say, you do better at simple tasks with an audience because of the high level of arousal, but worse at complex tasks with the same audience because of, again, the arousal level. There are optimum levels of arousal for each task type. And lastly, I want to finish off with the four crowd types. First, we have casual crowds. These are likely social aggregates, which spontaneously emerge when you're walking down a busy street, maybe to stop and stare at the person pretending to be a statue. Thus, casual crowds have little in common. Next, Conventional crowds are what you usually imagine. They're there for a purpose, like the crowd that forms to watch a parade. The behavior is very conventional and semi-structured. Third, expressive crowds are those which form to express an emotion, such as a rally for a presidential candidate. However, rallies can progress into the last type, an acting crowd. Just as the name implies, acting crowds are taking some sort of action towards a goal and can easily gain mob-like behavior and become destructive. So do you see how there's a progression here? Casual crowd can realize they want to stay for a purpose, thus becoming a conventional crowd. Well, that purpose may start to inspire some emotions, evolving them into an expressive crowd. And finally, they may act on these emotions, thus becoming an acting crowd. And that's the end of the episode.